Thanks for joining us again for the Clive Barker Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the works and worlds of Clive Barker. This is episode 137, The Great Unknown, Harry DeMore's First Adventure, where we talk about a May 1988 unproduced script written by Clive Barker. Uh, this plus Clive Barker and Hellraiser News, uh, Kickstarter update, and don't forget to go vote for your favorite character over at www.duelsofblood.com. Thanks for joining us again. This is episode 137 of the Clive Barker podcast, The Great Unknown. Mm -hmm. Um, Before we get to that, though, we want to talk a little bit about the news. Um, This this just came out a few days ago. Doug Bradley teased uh, something that he called the Pinhead Experience, which included a video of uh, him getting a life cast on his face by Tom Savini. Yeah, yeah, that looks pretty cool. Um, he, he he wrote a a Facebook post last Saturday saying that the cat is out of the bag. We've been keeping this quiet for nearly a year, and it feels great to finally let you all in on it. Um, so they, he he goes on to talk about how you know fans and show organizers always wondered you know if Doug could do something like take a pinhead photo op. Like I mean, Robert England did one. Once yeah. dressed as Freddy, not too long ago, I think, maybe a couple of years ago or something. Yeah. So that's pretty cool, and they were thinking about doing that for Pinhead, but uh, I think Doug Bradley doesn't really have a lot of stuff from his Pinhead costume, if anything at all. all I think all he had was like a box. And I've seen and, uh, where like Sid Haig did one as Captain Spaulding at one at like I think it was Texas Frightmare Weekend. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I mean you have to put on the face makeup and the grease paint but yeah. uh, then you need to have the little suit as well a little yeah the clown hat and stuff so anyway uh from doug's perspective if he's in makeup and costume he's in character so he, it seemed like uh, it would be weird for pinhead to you know doug bradley to be dressed as pinhead greeting fans and say hey how you doing <laughs> you know yeah so yeah uh that so he'd probably be dividing his time up into, you know, right now I'm doing this photo session thing, and then later I'll just be Doug Bradley sitting at a table. So they say, if Pinhead can't enter the fan's world, how can we bring you into his? If we were to do it, we would want it to stand apart from the rest. It would need to be different. We began to talk about something a little more involved than the photo ops that most fans were used to. We wanted to present an experience and not just a photograph, as close to stepping on set with Doug as Pinhead as we could make it. So th- I'm quoting Steph- Stephanie uh, Sciullo. Yeah. Uh, she's uh, Doug Bradley's uh, partner. We finally made the decision to go forward with our ideas, fully knowing it would be a stressful, expensive, time-consuming undertaking. It would have to be coordinated and funded solely by us, but even with that prospect, we would not skimp on details. So they hired some of the closest and most talented friends to bring it all to life. We can only hope that everyone will be happy with what we've been able to accomplish together. So they're going to unveil this for fans at the Mind Monster Party in Arizona uh, this upcoming May, which uh, I, I'll, I'll do my best to attend. And uh, it, it sounds like a, an amazing opportunity. So, yeah, they got the pinhead experience. And like, Ryan, you were saying that they had, like, a, a video where they show Tom Savini doing a live cast of Doug Bradley. It also and then shows they sh- some of the set uh, of the damp room that, that, they, that they've built. Yeah, with the little slats and the lights coming through it. And they also show, like, the process of, you know, remaking Pinhead's costume. You know, they show some uh, little uh, message bubbles of people talking back and forth. And like, hey, we need, a, we need to recreate Pinhead's costume. And then they show someone suing it all and molding it and, uh, you know, making the, the replica of, of Pinhead's suit. So I guess this is all homegrown by, uh, by uh, Steph and Doug. And uh, it looks amazing. The suit looks very realistic, and I'm sure that Tom Savini being involved is going to be an awesome makeup. So, yeah, yeah and, it seems and there like were other people that they reached out to for the costume as well, but I don't think they didn't name anybody. It's just you can recognize Tom Savini in the video. Sure, absolutely. So, <laughs> people were saying, like, like our friend Danny Stewart, he was saying, all we need now is the other Cenobites to join you in the photo op, Butterball, Cheddar, and the female Cenobite. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure Nicholas Vince and Simon Bamford are just uh, are totally, uh, you know, chomping at the bit to do that. Yeah, yeah, standing there for a whole afternoon taking pictures of fans with, like, 
completely like sensory deprivation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, even Barbie Wilde commented, wow, at this video. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think it's going to be amazing. If they say that Doug doesn't want to be off out of character when he takes pictures with the fans and he's wearing the makeup, mm-hmm. then I'm thinking that this will be, yeah, just like they say, just like stepping on set with Pinhead. And yeah. uh, I'm sure he'll That's be in cool. character and it'll be awesome. At uh, Texas Frightmare Weekend, also, they, they, had a, they had a thing similar to this with Clive Barker where he was standing behind a – you could pick between two backdrops. I think one of them was a, a, a like a puzzle box backdrop, and then there was an I forget what the other one was, and um, yeah. and and it was of course a separate event in a separate room from where the signing was. So they just you know they would just say okay everybody in line for the signing you're gonna have to wait a while because he's doing photo ops right now. Can you imagine a future where – I mean this looks like such a great production value that I was wondering just one photo probably doesn't really do it justice. I was wondering in the future, maybe – I don't know, starting with this. I don't think it's going to be that way. But uh, can you imagine in the future having like – instead of just a picture with your favorite character, you can do like a really short video? That would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah with Pinhead cool. like saying something to you like we'll tear your soul apart. Um, I don't know. It's just an idea I got. This is not probably not what's going to happen. But I was just thinking in, in today's world where everybody has a camera on their phone, that would be one amazing Instagram post. And speaking of Hellraiser, Dark Delicacies is teasing um, a Hellraiser anthology signing. And actually, uh, since I originally made this story, we've gotten an update. So now we know um, – now we know when it is and who's going to be there, and we know more details about it. So um, it's going to be Mark Miller and Ben Mears, mm-hmm. and it'll be Sunday, April 23rd, 4 p.m. at Dark Delicacies, and they'll have a big stack of, of uh, copies that are already pre-signed by Clive Barker as well. Oh, that's awesome. That's pretty good. So, I mean, even though Clive is probably not going to be able to make it, the you know he's going to be well represented. And, and also Matt Murray and uh, Re- Rebecca and David McKendry will be there signing also. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, the other writers and artists from uh, yeah. Hellraiser Anthology. Yes, yeah. that's that's pretty good, pretty so cool. That would, that would be neat. If I, I would totally be there if I could, but that's hard to justify flying to California. Yeah, I know. I know, it's in L.A. I mean, uh, yeah, and uh, – Dark Delicacies, of course, is the bookstore ran by uh, Del Howison, who's also done uh, was co-editor of uh, Midian and Maid, if you remember yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and so that's it for Clive Barker news. Um, our Duels of Blood is, of course, still going strong. We're in, we're still into round one. Uh, head over to www.duelsofblood.com. D u e l s o f b l o o d. Uh, duelsofblood.com and cast your votes before we've only got a week left so we're only halfway into it before the um before the tournament's over are there um, yeah the first round started voting five days ago um and you know we've done a a an episode since um when we opened up duels of blood so uh there's a lot of cool characters there that you can vote on yeah candy quake and bush is just one vote ahead of Christopher Carrion, and that's probably because of me. I just had to make a vote so that I could see how it's doing. So, <laughs> so that one, that one's really close. Um, I think Sartori versus Quasar is another one that's that's close, I believe. Yeah, and um, oh, and Gentle versus Pio Pa is another difficult one. So yeah, 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 if you're a fan of Aberat, if you're a fan of Imagica or The Graded Secret Show or The Books of Blood, which I'm assuming most of you are of at least one of those, mm-hmm. uh, go vote before this round is over because once this round is over, half of these characters are going to get eliminated. I am and, actually voting right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you can you can vote every five minutes if you want to, if you really want to push for one of your characters. Yeah. I'm actually looking at the results. Um, so, yeah, like you said, uh, Aberrat Bracket seems to be doing pretty well. And uh, we have had um, a lot of votes, not as many as the last year, but uh, we're still having plenty well, of votes here. Well, last year, last year, the first round was slow like this one because I think it's a, yeah. lo- it's a lot of voting to have to do. 
So uh-huh. um, it would it got up to like two hundred, you know, by the end of the first round last year. Sure, I remember one of them had like almost five hundred votes or more. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty amazing. Yeah, they, so they they um, they the, the the farther along we get, you know, the more people learn about it, and the more votes there are, and more people probably vote more than once too. Absolutely, you can vote every five minutes. So yeah. please go there and check it out. So, and if you really want to know who who would win between Buddy Vance and Homer, the guy that gets stabbed <laughs> in the eye with the pocket knife, uh, yeah, he, he, Buddy Vance is way ahead right now. Six, yeah, I'm looking at that. Four, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the between Kisun and the Death Boy, uh, yeah. Kisun is actually ahead, which is not surprising because Kisun is one of the best villains of the Ark trilogy. So. Yeah, and they're they're both recurring villains. They both came back for um, after we thought they were dead. I'm having a real hard time figuring out who to vote on Harry the Moor versus Tesla Bombeck. That's hard. It is hard. It is. I think I ended up choosing Harry Demore. I, I, who's I choose, ahead? By yeah, the way, yeah, I choose Harry because he's in um, because he he he's in so many things. Uh huh. And also, Tarata are beating the crap out of the hallucinogenia for some reason. <laughs> yeah. uh, the nightmare is summoned by the Jeff from the collective unconscious of uh, yeah. Buddy Vance's party revelers. Yeah. Uh, and hallucinogenia, of course, being the uh, the dreamlike fantasies, which are basically superheroes, celebrities, movie stars, uh, and the like. Yeah. Uh, they actually only have seven votes right now. So. Yeah. I think I voted for them. Mahogany is beating Swan by a little bit. And between the Yaduroboros and the Zahara Pushu, um, actually the Zahara Pushu are winning, which yeah. uh, gives me a lot of hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. the Zahara Pushu are, are friendly and helpful, and the Eon mm-hmm. want to devour you and make you crazy. So. Yeah. And then the Books of Blood bracket also, there's uh, there's some good, good matches there. So... Uh, we we have a few funny characters like Barbario's Cancer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so go check it out. And the Sal from Pig Blood Blues. Yeah. So, Who yes, go is, check it out. Is beating Wybird by a lot. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that is pretty cool. And Aaron is beating uh, beating Declan. Mm-hmm. Aaron yeah, I, from I haven't finished voting yet, but okay. I'll definitely do that. So what's next? Okay. So, yeah, www.duelsofblood.com. Um, so now uh, next is the, the Great Unknown. So this, if you don't know, which you may not because this is a rare um, script that was unproduced. Mm-hmm. It's Harry. De- it's, it's subtitled Harry Demore's First Adventure, written by Clive Barker, May 11th, 1988. So there's That's no, right. There's no, this, script, this version of the script actually you found on eBay – Mm-hmm. And our friend David went and bought it, and it was actually you found it during the recording of of our podcast with him. Yeah, that's right. I I, I decided to uh, to Google uh, Harry the Moor on eBay and stuff just to figure out w- what I could find, and immediately this script popped up, and I was like, holy moly! And I just told you guys immediately. So, so he he sent us. He was nice enough to send us copies, and I spiral bound mine with like. Um, with like um, cardstock covers. Oh, me too. Back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that to make it easier to read, because I could just imagine myself dropping it and having the pages go everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So, so but um, the, actually, I, I really liked this script, but it seemed really, really ambitious. Yeah, very ambitious, and not just that, also very complex. Um, yeah. The story it, is 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 very. It reminded me, do you remember that movie, John Carter of Mars, or just John Carter? Yeah. Where you had all these, like, characters and all these, like, weird, complicated names of, you know, the the creatures of Barsoom. There are more uh, more complex names in here than than regular names. Yes. You've got, like, Harry and Norma, but you've got, like, the Realm Qua and and, um, what else? Oh, the... Vaslima and Nazaku and the the Mesere and the Narthex. Yeah, there's a lot of weird names here, which is kind of like a staple of Clyde Barker stuff. But in this one, it really is uh, very, very complex, like the Safiliku and, uh, you know, that 
There's a lot of stuff. So basically, the, all these names are from characters from the Metacosm, which yeah. you will be familiar with if you've read the books of the art. Except that this is a pre uh, pre Gradient Secret Show version of the Metacosm, so it's a little different. Yeah, that's right. This is this is from 1988, uh, a few years before Clive ever wrote the Gradient Secret Show, I think. Or one year, I think. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So this was originally property of A and M Films, and A and M Films was a company that made some uh, some movies like The Breakfast Club. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, they were a production company. They made um, uh, Better Off Dead in 1985. Uh, one Crazy Summer in 1986. Jeez, this seems a little yeah. out of their wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but uh, right, right, exactly. And um, and so the book kind of starts. Um, the book starts with. Um, let me just uh, get my notes here. So you know, Harry Damore, he has a friend called Ray Gilreath. And uh, at first, I, I was wondering, is this the same guy that we see in the Lord of Illusions movie? But then I went to check that, and it turns out that other guy was called Loomis. So it's not the same guy. I was yeah. For a minute, I was wondering if there was going to be some sort of coherent... I think Ray you know, is probably a little closer analog to maybe his old partner that got killed in... In, um, in, in Brooklyn? Yeah. When he was in the force? Yeah, exactly. Okay. It seems more probably more related to that, because this is a friend of his that's on the police force, but Harry is still obviously a private detective, right. not, a, not a policeman. And um, so the the opening of this has some great scenes that reminded me a lot of the cultists in Lord of Illusions when they are, you know, when they receive the letter that says homecoming time and then all hell breaks loose. It kind of reminded me of this, but this is cooler because it opens up with a bunch of, like, uh, you know, criminals and psychopaths and mental patients being broken out of hospitals and jails all over the country. Um, and uh, there was riots. There's uh, – uh, I mean, the opening scene is amazing. It's a death row, literally in death row. Um, there's, a there's a guard. There's a criminal. There's a priest. And it turns out that the priest – uh, is is the guy who's going to break out this criminal. Yeah. And it's like, holy moly. He presses the O letter on Holy Bible, <laughs> yeah. and his Bible gets blades that snap out, and he kills, like, both guards. Yeah. And he breaks out the, the criminal. And it's like, that's, okay, you won me. This is like the opening. The fir first page of the script has this scene, and it's like, okay, I I'm one I thought for sure he was like, there to assassinate the guy in prison. Right. When, when I read that, and then he killed the guards, I'm like, wow, yeah, this totally came out of nowhere. Yeah, so all these these scenes in the beginning of the script have, um, you know, either orderlies uh, breaking out mental patients by sticking their hypodermic needles on guards, and uh, there's a, a giant... Uh, a giant uh, prison riot and all that. It's, it's really cool. And there's even a senator that just is just done doing a, a, a speech, and he walks out of the podium, and he gets stopped by one of the henchmen of the villain of this, who's a guy called Mazzetti. Yeah. So it's a mysterious Mr. Mazzetti, who's kind of like a mobster-like figure. Yeah. But he's, he's all is not as it seems. Yeah. But all is not as it seems, because as it turns out, He's not really Mazzetti, but, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so, yeah, on this night, after all this introduction, we see um, Harry Damore. He's uh, trying to – he's doing a stakeout trying to uh, get proof that someone is cheating on their wives or something. Yeah. And, and then uh, uh, he ends up meeting a couple of creatures from the metacosm. So – yeah, yeah. So he, he sees trouble and he's like, all right, she's thinking, should I get out of the car and go help or should I just stay here and, you know, I'm just seconds away from catching these two kissing that I could take a picture and I get to go home. But of course, he, you know, being Harry Demore, he's always drawn into the dark side. And so he, he sees this struggle and he, he runs over to help and, and gets involved in this sort of, uh, this, you know, Actually, there's something I want uh, that I I've been thinking quite a bit about in in uh, 
the difference between horror and science fiction is really whether something is supernatural or whether it's like, you know, from outer space or whatever. Sure. You know, um, so that, that guy, oh, what was his name that wrote that, you know, that gave away the whole script of this and kind of ruined it for everybody. I think uh, it was a movie reviewer called Andy Mangles yes. and he was working for Fantasia. So, so if you ever want to find this article, it's, I think, Fantasia number 13. It's got the dinosaurs on the cover, you know, not the mommy. Yeah. So, yeah, so look it up. So he he called this science fiction and said, like, you know, this is the whole – this and the Great and Secret Show or the reason that that uh, that Clive Barker's fiction is no good anymore and that why can't he just stick to his horror roots and stuff like that. And right. I think I think that that's not that's unfair because I think that in this case, you know, where do you decide whether this is? I mean, horror has supernatural stuff, and science fiction has like you know, outer space. Oh yeah, or or, future, or you're in the future. So where where do you decide here that whether this is horror or science fiction? I think that I I I don't think that you can just as as clearly make that case as he did. Well, yes, I agree with what you said, but also I think that his, his immediate mistake is just trying to tell an artist what to do and trying to, to say you should stay in this pigeonhole, you know, and, and just well, well, do, yeah, what, that's, do that's, what you're good at doing. That's the other which, part, yeah. Yeah, which is ridiculous. I mean, yeah. he says that uh, Barker's uh, – this is – I'm quoting from the article now. Uh, Barker's recent penchant for the metaphysical becomes so self-involved as to lose the reader, viewer here, much as in The Great and Secret Show – which, of course, is a pile of bullshit because, yeah. I mean, The Great and Secret Show is one of Clyde Barker's best books, in my opinion. Of course, this is all subjective, but yeah. I, I think we can we can agree that the art trilogy or the planned art trilogy, as we still only have two books. But if it's turned into a trilogy, then it's, it's pretty ambitious in scope and it's pretty awesome. And, again, I, I, I just – I'm not trying to say that just as a fan, but uh, it is one of his best works, uh, I think – so it proves that Clyde Barker did a good job with the Books of Blood, but then I think that when he turned into the Fantastic or the Dark Fantastic, as he likes to call it, that that was a good choice because it opened up a whole new world of possibilities for his fiction instead of just being like, okay, uh, let's do another take on zombies or let's do like something – you know, that has, um, you know, a uh, monster coming from hell or whatever, like The Last Illusion. Uh, now he can switch into, like, interdimensional stuff. He can create a whole mythology of the metacosm, yeah. you know. And it – not only that, but it also opens up, to be honest, opens up his audience to, uh, you know, uh, more than just people who like horror. Because fantasy is a very well-loved genre. I mean, uh, it's easier for someone to get into fantasy – than to get into like horror, graphic horror, splatterpunk, or whatever, yeah. because that's that doesn't appeal so much to a lot of people. So uh, yeah, I think he he did a great job switching it into the dark fantastic because it opened up the possibilities for his stories, and instead of just being the random like horror stuff, it also created some situations in here that can be more horrific than anything you could imagine in a more typical sort of horror story. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I'm thinking of the the ending. Um, you know, and I guess we're skipping ahead, but <laughs> but you know the the um, this this creature's bowels being opened up and seeing the you know all the 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 half alive bodies of the people that it ate mm -hmm. inside. You know, just that 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 seemed more horrific than 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 lots of you know lots of more more uh, typical kind of. Or stuff, and I think certainly it reminded me more of uh, the Dream Child, or uh, I think the Dream Child, Nightmare on Elm Street. Which one is the one where Freddy shows up and you see like these souls trying to come out of his chest at the end of the movie? Oh yeah, yeah, that would, it's either that would like be, the third or fourth movie. Yeah, yeah. I, I get those confused also. I just yeah. remember two was the awful one where they said like, um, if you turn your back on him, he disappears. Right. Right. And, and the power of love would kill him or something like that. But since the story is very complex, let me just – I think I'm going to use this article from Fantasia actually to uh, – because he did a good job spoiling the script. Uh, yeah. He did a good job you know, summarizing everything. So here's just a quick snippet of it. It says, uh, Harry comes across a pair of seeming extraterrestrials who are trying to protect a mysterious object known as the Nazaku. 
Unfortunately for them and Harry, Mazzetti and his supernatural goons um, are um, are uh, trying to get to Nazuku and will stop at nothing to do so. After a weird and violent battle with the octopus-like Moffrey, Damour escapes, but not before the female alien, Lucia, has put the Nazaku in his pocket. He unknowingly takes it to Norma Payne's apartment. She's an old psychic who fills Harry with dire warnings of a parallel universe known as the Metacosm, especially after the Nazaku is breached and genie-like man escapes from it. Uh, the next day, Harry receives a visit from his cop ex-partner uh, before Mazzetti's goons capture him and take him to see their boss. Unknown to any of them, Lucia follows. Harry is locked away after a perfunctory meeting with Mazzetti. Holy crap. But not, <laughs> but not before he sees the real Mazzetti also locked in a basement prison. He's really seems, spoiling the whole script. I know, it's amazing. Oh it God. seems that the man posing as Mazzetti is a metacosm alien who reports to the Tetrarch about the impending invasion and the part the missing Nazaku plays in it. I'm going to stop here for now because this goes on for a little while longer. And, uh, but yeah, you can see from this summary how complex the story is. And, yeah. and trust me, if you read the script, there's a lot more than, to it than this. Yeah. I mean, you have like a crossover house that has like the Safiliku and all these like other creatures. It's like there's two factions. One faction is following the Tetrarch, who is this like shapeless emperor god kind of creature. And his brother is called the the oh help me out here <laughs> the, the realm qua the realm qua okay yeah. realm qua is a monster whose brother he's the brother of the tetrarch and again he's just a shapeless thing I mean he's just like kind of like a mixture between a lobster and a nest of snakes and the more the more it eats the bigger and more powerful it gets and it can only eat evil which is why all these all these evil people were broken out of prisons and and um... Uh, mental hospitals and stuff like that. It's like, hey, we're having a party for all you guys. Yeah, just... actually, there are 44, 44 major yeah. criminals, including senators and, like, uh, chiefs of staff or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a weird, like, little little thing. I mean, we have to think of this as a product of its time, like the late 80s. So, to be honest... As a movie, and I was trying to imagine, I was trying to envision this in my mind as I was reading the script. I was like, all right, yeah. let me try to imagine the scene. Okay, let's – and I was listening to some music in the background just to try to make it more cinematic. And I was like, all right, cool, cool. And I was trying to visualize what sort of angles this would have. It's like, all right, let's close in on this guy's face. And it's like after a while, it just became so tiring to do that because the story just uh, keeps jumping around. So I think that this as a movie – it would have been – first of all, it would have to be an extremely expensive production. Second of all, um, I think that there's some things here that are – you know, you kind of look at these nowadays and you think like, oh, that's kind of like a little tropey. Um, uh, for example, there's like uh, – there's a scene where uh, Norma and Harry are talking and, and Harry's like complaining to Norma, oh, why does this always happen to me? And she's like, well, this is who you are. And it's like – Okay, yeah, I get it. Every single Harry the Moore story has to have a moment where Harry complains about, why does this always happen to me? Yeah. But um, but there's there's some stuff here that I thought was really good, like the opening of the script is amazing. This would be a great comic book if they adapted it to comic book form nowadays, I think. It would be a better comic book than a movie. Oh, there it could was, be a comic book series. There, there was one uh, – actually, that would be a really good idea for Seraphim – Inc. to take on. If you guys are listening, Seraphim Inc. Yes. <laughs> we would love to see a comic series of, of, uh, of this because uh, it's probably never going to be turned into a movie at this point. Um, but, oh, there was one thing I was going to bring up that I had um, that uh, this had never been uh, this had never been brought up before, but uh, they the uh, M- Mazzetti asks Harry, what does the M stand for? And Harry M. Damore. And we find out it's Myron is his middle name. Yeah, yeah. I remember <laughs> posting about it on Facebook when I was reading that. And I was like, holy crap, now I know what the M is for. Yeah. So Myron. Um, so, yeah, a little bit more of the story is with Lucia's help, Harry escapes uh, Mazzetti's basement prison. And then Mazzetti sets his half-sister, who's a harpy-like drone named yeah. Vaslima, after them. There's a cool uh, – there's a really cool scene – where um, Harry is 
uh, outside in the street, and the, he sees the monster approach, and he kind of fights it off, and then he gets into a taxi, and there, it's a really awesome action scene. Yeah. Where, yeah, like the the cabbie is driving the taxi, and he's like, get out of my cab, and it's like, uh, just drive, otherwise we're both dead. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, the, 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 the drone... It's just this weird uh, winged creature with just one eye in its forehead, and it can turn into a woman. So um, it seems like again, every, every creature and you know, a lot of creatures just have one eye in the middle of their forehead, like the Malfrey does, also. Yeah, and the Malfrey is also a particularly fascinating character because he's like always stuck in this little box, but when you release him, he's just this mass of tentacles. And then he starts breaking everything around him, and he starts constructing his body every time. Yeah. So that's – I thought that was a really clever um, – a really yeah. clever uh, artifact for this, this, this monster to, to do. And, and because, a lot of this yeah. stuff in this script could be done with CGI that would have been really difficult in 1988 or 1989 or whenever this movie yeah. was made. There probably would have been like stop motion or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, because this was it, it, we were still a little far from uh, Terminator 2's uh, CGI effects, I guess. Right, right, yeah, and like Alien Three, and um, but so the the oh yeah, there, there was one really interesting fact also that was just sort of offhandedly mentioned by Lucia. She's like, oh yeah, in my world, uh, my my kind are food for the drones. It's like, wow, mm-hmm. that's you know that's. We're so used to uh, living in a world where we're at the top of the food chain. You sort of forget that, you know, eh, it's possible maybe somewhere else that intelligent creatures could be still not be the top of the food chain. I just didn't understand one particular detail about that, which is uh, the drone seems to have this sort of hypnotic power over Lucia. Yeah. But that doesn't seem to happen with any other characters that come from the same faction as Lucia. So I was, I was just wondering about that. Um but I think this was one of the things that was a little, a little tropey for me because it, it, I was like, oh, okay. So that's that's a quick and easy way for her to kind of give in to the drone and create more tension to the uh, to the, the, the scene here. Well, but, what's, yeah, and it's also strange because Lucia and Mazzetti seem like they're the same – seem like they're the same race, right? Because they both have that lizard face underneath their human face. Did Lucia have that? Yeah. Yeah, at the beginning of the script, I think she did for a second. Oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, so these are, again, these are not humans. These are creatures from the metacosm. But, uh, yeah, so back at Harry's apartment, Lucia tells him that the Tetrarch sent his half-brother, Realm Qua, to New York years ago as part of an invasion, okay, because he feeds on evil. So, yeah, he's going to go to New York <laughs> in the yeah. 80s, I guess, Yeah. or, or the... Uh, or yeah, a few years ago. So this this should take place in like the mid '80s when the Realm Qua goes there. So it's kind of weird that Clive makes like New York this uh, haven of depravity and crime. I guess I guess it it was a little bit like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, back in the '80s, uh, people complained a lot about garbage and crime and murders and stuff. Nowadays, I guess New York is much cleaner than that. But um, so Lucy and Harry also figure out that Mazzetti has been keeping the Realm Qua alive. And is about to power him with the hate and evil of the murders and insane people he has freed previously. And then this guy wrote in the article, got the, all of this so far? If not, the story's not stopping for you. Uh, yeah, this story is kind of like a, a, a runaway train. It, it it keeps going on. It, it all takes place very, very quickly. And it, it this is not something that has any sort of like break in the action. It, it's pretty much ongoing from beginning to end. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that it's not really – it's also kind of not fair to judge this, you know, what this movie could have been because this must be a first draft, right? There's no, like, second draft or anything written anywhere on here. Yeah, and, it sounds uh, like it. And so I think that uh, by the time it got to screen, it would have been a little different from what it is right now. Yeah, but this, as a first draft goes, it just shows Clive's genius because it's a heck of a first draft. Um yeah. Yeah, it's very I, – I particularly like the flow of the action and how sometimes – like I said, sometimes it feels like, oh, my God, this – I have to take a break from the script, the script because it's so complicated and it, the action is so intense. You feel like, all right, I'm just going to take a quick break and then get back to it. Yeah. 
But um, and Harry Demore keeps going back to his apartment, even though the bad guys, you know, that they know where he lives. Yeah, yeah, they do. But uh, funny things that uh, you learn from this is that, uh, uh, for example, Norma has a dog called Tooth. Yeah, that's cute. I don't think we've ever seen that dog appear in any other stories. Um, right. Neither in the books of arts or Lost Souls or the Scarlet Gospels, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. His tooth would be long dead by the Scarlet Gospels. Sure, sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff. The Nazaku is a – at first he's like a little idol, an object that is like stuck in uh, – Lucia sneaks in into uh, Harry Demore's pocket and then he kind of, you know, gets fr- released in um, – you know, gets released, and he's kind of like this genie guy. Yeah, he's kind of like the Wishmaster in a way, mm-hmm. um, because he's not human, but he looks human, uh, and he's a great warrior that comes from the metacosm. And I just didn't understand exactly what was his origin and his yeah. thing. You know, are there more like him? I didn't really understand that. Um, but he's feared because he's the he's something that the opposition brought of the, to the Tetrarch brought over to Earth to destroy the Realm Qua. Yeah, and, and it's apparently, always kind of a it's a it's a it's sort of a vain hope because you can't control him once you let him out. He's going to do whatever he wants. Right. But it's the only hope that they have. Exactly. So all right. So Harry gets into a battle with the drone while Lucia is kidnapped. But I can't, actually, you're going to find out that she was kidnapped by her own like faction. Um, the Mazetti starts to feed, and the missing Nazaku party animal and expert fighter gets laid. Oh, yeah, this scene is, is kind of funny. Um, the Nazaku is a little hokey in the way that he constantly somersaults everywhere. Um, <laughs> he backflips, yeah. Yeah, he's like this very athletic warrior, and he's got a sword, and he's always, like, backflipping. And some parts where he backflips a little too much, I think. There's one part <laughs> where he just backflips funny. over an, a, a bar just to make himself a drink. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. Well, that's enough now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I like the Nazaku. But he, yeah, he ends up uh, befriending a prostitute, I think. And, yeah, and that, well, that isn't fair to say that the Nazaku gets laid. That's not true. I mean, she, she offers and he tells her that he, you know, he, he doesn't do that. Right. And so we see the Mazzetti uh, imposter talking to the Tetrarch, and the, the Tetrarch says, it's time. Yeah. And uh, so Harry finds out his ex-partner has sold out the human race. Yeah, Ray, uh, in, a, in a twist of fate, uh, ends up uh, showing up with Mazzetti. And, uh, yeah, he's, he's wearing a medallion that, that all of the people that are complicit in this takeover of the Earth are wearing. Yeah. It reminded me a little bit of the... the, the um, the Midnight Meat Train movie, where they had the the people who who knew about the first American and the and the um, the city fathers wore a medallion that would say that hey, I'm one of the people that's it, you know that's in on this plot. Right, right, right. And it, it's the typical like a uh, good guy turned villain kind of thing, where it's like, well, they promised they would make me the ruler of this place if I help them out, and you know. The big Cthulhu monster is coming, and everybody's going to die except for the ones who helped. So I'm on the winning side. Get on the winning side. Yeah. Uh, that, but, of course, that, at the uh, end, you know, the the bad guys, you know, get sort of fed to the realm qua also. Right. So, okay. So, uh, yeah. So the Nazaku, they end up talking to the Nazaku. Uh, Harry and, and Lucia find him again. And they say, we need your help to defeat the realm qua. And he says, nah, I think I'm good. You know, I think I'm just going to watch. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's your world. I don't really care that much, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll play with whatever's left. And so all this all this thing about the Nazaku, and I feel like the Nazaku doesn't really do much um, as he's supposed to do until the very, very end where he, he, he just jumps into the fray a little bit. Yeah, but, he, but he's been watching the whole time. And, yeah, and the thing that well, what's kind of funny is that you know that there's this sort of running uh, running theme that the Nazaku loves slapstick comedy and he loves watching the Three Stooges. So yeah. there, that comes up a couple of times throughout the script, and then at the end there are these two guys arguing and fighting with each other and getting into some sort of slapstick stuff that he thinks is hilarious, 
And mm-hmm. then the Realm Qua eats them. And he's like, hey, you know, now you've gone too far. And that's, that's taking what, away my entertainment. Yeah, that's what make, gets the Nozaku into the fight, which is kind of funny. I mean, I think this character is this character is is crazy. Um, but I would love to see it in a movie. I don't think yeah. that we, we get enough movies with just weird kind of out there stuff like that. Yeah. People get I know so what you concerned mean. about uh test you know test script testing and or you know with audience with test audiences and and uh feedback and stuff like that that he's a quirky character and some parts in the script the nazaku ends up becoming this unwitting uh, almost comic relief in a way yeah it, it's it, there's just some weird scenes with him and like i said i think he somersaults a little too much i would have made him a straighter character um and, yeah, and, I would have uh, made him a little more straight. When he first escaped, he, he he Harry found him up on the roof of the building, and then he dove down in this cloud of wind and sliced at Harry, and Harry's like, at least I didn't get hurt, and then his tie falls off on the floor. Yeah, that's typical, like, anime kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, so another thing that I thought I could see this coming a little bit far away was... When Mazzetti is talking to the Tetrarch, he's doing that in a chamber called the Narthex, yeah. um, which is located in this, this giant mansion that he took over from uh, the real Mazzetti. And around this Narthex are these spinning blades, like these swords or whatever, that kind yeah. of frame that. That, that, was, that was hard for me to picture the way it was described. I would yeah. like to see that in, in the movie. But I kind of thought, why are these swords here? Is someone else going to get hurt with this thing later down the line? And I guess I was right. I mean, there's one yeah. part where the drone, after it tries to kill Harry in the taxi chase scene and all that, gets really, really hurt. He gets shot at. He, he, he gets, like, rammed by the car. So he's dying. Okay, so the, 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 the drone is dying, and it reverts back to, a, like, a half-woman, half-drone form. And uh, Lucia shows up at Mazzetti's uh, place to try to kill Mazzetti to prevent him from releasing the Realm Qua. And the drone, even though it's dying, it still wants to get revenge, so it attacks Lucia. And uh, she ends up, uh, they end up uh, fighting in the Narthex chamber. And obviously, when I saw those swords, they were spinning and stuff. And I was like, all right, I guess I know where this is going. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lucia actually kind of like avoids an attack and pushes the drone onto the knives and she dies. Yeah. And I was like, I guess I I figured that this was kind of being set up for something like this. But, you know, still, it's pretty cool. It's 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 a it's a, a very good action scene. And Clive does write good action in this script. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. I, I love the final fight with the, the Realm Qua eating all of the bad guys. The ending of the script is kind of a little bit like a big kaiju movie in a way. Yeah, yeah. It's getting bigger and bigger, and then it blasts out the out through the front wall, I guess. Yeah, but this would have been um, a movie that would have been completely at home in the late 80s because just of the way that it's structured and, and, and the way that it's – I, I don't want to say done by the numbers because it's not really done by the numbers, although the general strokes of the story are is kind of straightforward. The the complexity is in the characters and the descriptions and the, you know, the, the things that they show us are more complex. It, it, I mean, the, the Narfi, I mean, the, that monster that's just a mess of tentacles that constructs his body from whatever's available, that's totally an original idea. I've never seen anything like it before. Yeah. This is – yeah. And so in, in, in an alleyway fight, the this monster creates a body made out of garbage. But then when there's a fight inside a mansion full of artwork and sculptures, it makes a body full of like, you know, made out of sculptures and bits of like paintings. So just fantastic, fantastic monsters, fantastic creatures. I think there's one that you particularly enjoyed, right? Yeah. Well, before we get to that one, there was another thing relating to what you had said about uh, showing something and then having a callback to it later. There's a a painting that has like a dog that comes to life and jumps out and attacks anybody who has a weapon. So it, it almost gets hairy because he has a gun and they ask him to, to put his gun down. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and then you, you see that and you think, Oh, that's going to be a callback later. 
and and it and it is it uh, at the very very end of the of the movie he you know that that comes back and gets uh, Ray what's his face the, uh, yeah Gilreath Gilreath um, one thing about that is did you think that that mural that mural takes place in a place called the crossover house which yeah. is where the Sephiliku uh, uh, um, and a few other uh, creatures from that faction, the same faction Lucia belongs to, mm -hmm. they have this these murals inside that building, which is a sacred building. Um, and the murals are alive, and it reminded me of Cold Heart Canyon in a bit, in oh, a way. Oh, yeah, yeah. You remember that mural, yeah. that uh, the tile mur mural? Yeah, from, the, de uh, the, the Devil's Country. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah. That's exactly it. It reminded me a little bit of that. And yeah, I was wondering was cool. how much did Clive reuse this idea for Cold Hard Canyon or if it just came back to him in a completely unrelated way. Yeah. I, I yeah. I mean I think he's got a lot of stuff similar things floating around in his mind that come back once in a while. Yeah. I, one thing I really like and I think was really true to the the character of Harry Demore is I love the way that he he understates what's going on and he you know he's just sort of weary and tired and and uh and you know everybody, everything to everybody else, everything is like the most important thing in the in the world, and the end of the world is coming. And Harry's like, you know, he comes into he, when he first comes into Norma Payne's office, she says, "You smell bad, Harry. What have you been doing?" And he says, "Wrestling in trash." Story of my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, sure. The thing about Harry the Moore in this script is he's completely, you know, relentless. He he does not give up. I mean, yeah. even when. He actually says to the Nazaku, as he the uh, the, the Nazaku outside of the uh, building where the Realm Qua is killing all those criminals and feeding on their evil, and he's about to break loose from like an eleven-story building. And Harry is saying to the Nazaku, "Are you going to help us defeat this?" And he's like, "Nah, I think I'll watch." And then Harry goes like, "Well, uh, okay, can you at least tell me if he has any weak points?" Because that just shows. How Harry is so unwilling to quit. He's just yeah. he's just going to try whatever it takes because. And there's a couple of points in this movie where he's he uh, he believes he's sacrificing himself, like wants to help Lucia escape, and you know wants to try to to uh, to kill the monster. Yeah, yeah. Um, another few things that I noticed in this uh, script were, for example, a callback. I think this might be a callback to the Lost Soul story. Uh, uh, it, it may be that, it may just be a coincidence. But on page 82 of this script, you read, On the corner of a street, a soprano sings Puccini. She's dressed in the remnants of an evening dress and has gathered a sizable audience. Harry walks past her, the music drifting with him. And here's what I found in Lost Souls. This is when the cankerist, the the murderer for the Vatican, mm -hmm. is uh, is walking down the street. He says... It was late afternoon, and the weather was worsening. A woman was singing nearby, an Italian, some tragic aria. Tears close, Linda turned from the pain the song carried and set off again in no particular direction. As the crowd consumed her, a man in a gray suit slipped away from the audience that had gathered around the street corner, Diva, sending the youth he was with ahead through the throng to be certain they didn't lose their quarry. And this is uh, Marchetti, uh, wow. or Marchetti, yeah, yeah the, the cankerist. The yeah. Which and sounds kind of like Mazzetti. Yeah, and then he says something like, The singing had much amused him. Her voice, long ago drawn in alcohol, was repeatedly that vital semitone shy of its intended target, a perfect testament to imperfect imperfectibility, rendering Verdi's high art laughable even as it came within sight of transcendence. And, you know, so he, there's a lady singing an aria, an Italian aria, uh, on a street corner in both of these uh, wow. scripts. And I was just wondering if that was somehow a callback. Or if it's just an image that Clive holds to heart and likes to use every once in a while. Well, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's also interesting to want you know to sort of wonder if the church might might not have wanted to get involved in an event like this. Oh, you mean like the, what happens in the script here? Yeah, like the the cankerist. You know, maybe it would have been good for him to show up and. Uh, yeah. Help take care of this situation because they wouldn't want they wouldn't want the, the tetrarch to take over the world either. Right, right. Well, I guess it, it, this is all pretty hush hush. So maybe they didn't know about it. Maybe just uh, it was just Harry that kind of stumbled into it. Really, yeah. I mean, otherwise it, it seemed like something that was just 
between two interdimensional factions, which is also kind of a way that Everville starts, right? There's a marriage going on between two different tribes yeah. of the metacosm. And then, you know, uh, that girl walks into it and she says a word and breaks everything. So the, um, the, um, the, the main boss, the Tetrarch, is sort of this spectral, you know, terrifying figure. Almost almost reminds me a little bit of Hepeximendios or like the Iad. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in the way he's controlling things from behind the scenes, but uh, if he ever gets here to Earth, then you know, then then it's all over. And and uh, at first, I thought that he was. It's like you ha you had I, I a terrify. There's a terrifying vision of a crab-like creature that comes. There's this vortex that sucks everything up, and it's there's this crab with mechanical arms grabbing things, you know, from inside of the vortex and bringing them in and pulling them through. And but that that creature is called the Mesere, and somewhere behind the Mesere is where the Tetrarch is. At least that was yeah. kind of the impression that I got of it. Well, he sent a vortex. Apparently, it's something that the Tetrarch could send. Um, yeah, and he sends it a couple of times in this script. And the vortex is really just this kind of interdimensional like whirlpool where it kind of breaks away. Uh, you know, the, the structure of our reality. And then it, it kind of pokes through to the other side where you can just, you know, drag people or stuff into it and, and take them, you yeah. know, <clears throat> and he does it also at the end, uh, in the narthex, uh, after, after he is defeated, he kind of sends a vortex to destroy everything that was left in the uh, more Mazzetti's, uh, uh, mansion. <clears throat> so, but the, the way that this ends, I, I guess we can say it is that, uh, as the Ronqua breaks out of the building and Harry asks the, the Nazaku, what's his weak spot? He says, well, it's his belly, you know. Oh, and how do I get to it? You get eaten. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so and, and Harry's like, oh, OK, thanks. And um, so the Ronqua has been eating all these like horrible criminals. And I have to say the reason the way that Mazzetti kind of brings all these people together is a little silly. Um, so he broke all those people out of these prisons to become food for the Romqua because he feeds on evil and chaos. Yeah. But the way that he makes them all work together or, or be part of his, you know, kind of personal army is that he tells them that, well, I'm going to retire. And as you know, I'm very influential and I'm very rich. So um, I want to figure out who's going to take over my empire of $100 million. Yeah. I guess at the time in 1988, there were no billionaires. You know yet, what? I, I so. kept thinking of. Uh, I kept thinking of oh, what is that movie um, where he says a million dollars? Oh, um, uh, Austin Powers. Austin, or something? I kept thinking of Austin Powers because he had hidden a million dollars, and the, these people are like killing each other and tearing the house apart. Yeah, to yeah. Get a million dollars. So yeah, so Mazzetti says to these people, um, but first we need to find out who's worthy of my empire. So I'm going to take you to this place, and it's an 11 story building, 166 rooms. And he says, I've hidden a million dollars in this yeah. building. So the first one to find it uh, becomes like my successor. And that's yeah. that's just meant to start this kind of – have you ever seen It's a Mad, 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 Mad World? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it yeah. kind of reminds me of that. Everybody starts running to the elevators and trying to break – break apart the building and see if they can find the million dollars. Yeah. And um, they're just playing into the Realm Quas trap, really. Uh, right, because that, that, that greed greed and violence and stuff attracts it. So yeah. Harry realizes that, and he drops all of his weapons on the ground and so that the Realm Qua will go past him. Yeah. Um, but, yes, so all those crazy, like, criminals and stuff are being eaten away by this black goo that kind of reminds me of the Yad Ouroboros from the uh, art trilogy. Yeah, yeah. And you have to wonder, if that thing is like the Tetrarch's brother, I guess the Tetrarch is just keeping that appearance of, you know, humanity, I guess. Well, and the Tetrarch is intelligent and wants to take over, you know, our world. And, right. And the, 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 <clears throat> the Realm Quad doesn't, just seems like a, a mindless beast. Yeah, it does. It does seem like it's just driven by its own appetites, like yeah. a true monster. Um, so it, maybe in they're saying it's his brother, but you know, in Clyde Barker's fiction, 
you know, these filial uh, familiar uh, ties are always very fluid, and it's like, yeah. okay, well, I guess one one creature can be brothers with another, but one can be just a mindless monster, and the other could be like this intelligent, like clever demon. So yeah. I guess that didn't bother me too much. And, and eventually, but, Harry sort of recruits the Nizaku to to attack the the Realm Claw. And so the Nizaku keeps slashing with his sword this same spot on the belly, and he finally opens up a hole in in the in the creature's belly. Yeah, and as they escape before that, before they escaped from Mazzetti's uh, prison, the real Mazzetti was released along with the uh, escaped along with Harry, and so the real Mazzetti, uh, who's been uh, regularly drained by this fake Mazzetti to keep his appearance and take his like memories and appearance and power. Um, he escapes and he says, well, let's go to the library first. And he takes out this War and Peace volume from the shelves and this door opens in his library and it's a freaking arsenal. Okay. Well, no, it was more Scooby-Doo than that. Like he pulls this book back and then the whole, the whole bookshelf spins around with them standing, you know, with them taking them with it and yeah. puts them in this arsenal room. Right. Just like the, that secret passage in, uh. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Yeah. And uh, and they get armed to the teeth. And so one of the things that this real Mazzetti dude uh, takes is a grenade. Yeah. So when when the Nazaku is slicing at the same spot in the Realm Quad's belly, uh, there's a grenade on the floor because, you know, Mazzetti dropped it. And uh, what Harry does is he grabs a grenade and then he jumps into the Realm Quad's stomach and he he wants to pull the pin in the grenade, but he can't because you know the the inside, all the guts and the meat and stuff, like you said, um, start grabbing see, at him and trying to pull him in. Yeah, because you can see all the people that the realm qua has eaten are uh, like stretched out and deformed and part of the realm qua now. So yeah, that was a great visual image right there. Yeah, yeah, um, really terrifying. Yeah, when the Nazaku slices open the realm qua, you. He says you can hear the howls of the men inside. Yeah. Wow. It's so creepy. Yeah. And so Harry's trying to pull the pin on the grenade. It's, you know, it's the last scene in the movie. And he can't because he, you know, his arms, he can't reach the pin of the grenade. So from within the guts of the Realm Qua, the real Mazzetti shows up and he pulls the pin and I was just – I swear to God, I imagined the scene with Mazzetti giving Harry the thumbs up and just slicing back <laughs> into, the, into the guts. Okay, and then Harry jumps out of the monster just as the grenade kaboom explodes everything. Yeah. So not much of a super powerful monster if a grenade is just going to kill it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess it's become more physical because of all the people that it ate. Yeah, I guess. And, oh, and that's true. He was He was becoming more physical. That's true. You can see that he starts taking off – taken on a form and a physicality whereas at the beginning he's just like this formless uh shadowy goo so maybe that was yeah maybe that made him a little more vulnerable and there's one more ending which i think if it were in a movie nowadays they would have put it you know in the middle of the credits or at the end of the credits yeah um, but uh where harry's was it is he at home no no he goes back to the he goes back to that halfway house right the yeah, he goes back to the crossover house. The crossover but at, house, at, yeah. Yeah, but at first he goes home and he listens to his uh, um, answering machine. And there's a message from Norma because Norma could see in his hand – I mean not see because she's blind. But she she touched his hand and she could like visualize his lifeline was taking him far, far away. And she was like, oh, no, you're going to go – you're going to be going far, far away. And he says, am I going to die? And, you know, but but she doesn't really reply to that. So what happens now is that Norma left him a message and she says, you know, if you're still there, um, let me just check that message. I want to talk quick. to you, I think it was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so if you're still there, Harry, come see me. Tell me all about it. Not that I blame you, you know, if you'd gone. And so L Lucia um, – has has gone back to uh, her world, I guess, in the metacosm. So, um, but she actually tells Harry if she if he wants to come, and he says no. But then, as he's in his house and he listens to this and he thinks back to Lucia, because of course Harry 
and Lucia become love interests during the story. He kisses a, a couple of times to snap her out of a uh, trance that she was mm -hmm. in, uh, being hypnotized by the drone. So he kind of shakes her. It doesn't work. Then he kisses her, and she snaps out of it. And then they ask something like, uh, what was that? And he says, it's called love. <laughs> kind of a, you know, kind of a goofy uh, line to say. But yeah. And he does that again at some other point where he kisses her and, you know. So obviously they set him up to be a uh, love interest, even though they're completely, you know, they're different species of, of things. I mean, she's a reptile, interdimensional creature. He's a human. But as he's sitting there, after listening to Norma's message, he just, like, jumps out and he runs across the city and he just runs over to the crossover house or what's left of it. And he tries to find the, the hallway with the uh, interdimensional mural. And uh, he does find his friend Ray there. Yeah. Yeah. I thought Ray got eaten. Me too. But, no, I think he just ran away from – he was oh, outside right. of the building and then he kind of runs away. Yeah, and this part bugs me a little bit. It kind of reminds me because the, the character had kind of, you know, before this, the character had kind of realized that, you know, maybe I was on the wrong side after all. And, you know, uh, it, it seemed like he was feeling a little bad for what he had done. But then, you know, now he's made another 180 degrees and he's kind of like, oh, you, it's, it reminds me of the Cenobites at the end of Hellraiser, you know, turning on Kirsty after they'd already oh, yeah. made a deal with her. Right, right. Yeah, and he's like, "Oh, you know, they, I was gonna be, I was, I was gonna be number one, or I was gonna be a, you know, on the winning team, and I was gonna be a powerful man." And like, "No, you're not. You weren't. You were not. You were gonna get fed to the realm quad. That's what the that's what the bad guy was trying to do to you." Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Um, it was all just a trick. To... But obviously, that thing you you said was set up like when. When Harry was first in the crossover house and he had a gun in his pocket and the Safiliku, what was the name of that? Oh, gosh. Uh, That's the one one of the, one of name that I didn't write down and I wish that I did. He, yeah, he, I know. He even had pronunciation guides the first time that he, he mentioned each one of these names. Yes. So he's, when he's, he was first in... When he was first in the crossover house, he had a gun in his pocket, Harry. And that's when you mentioned that there was this kind of creature from the living mural that started approaching, you know, the edge of the wall and was like, Ur. and and Lucia tells him you have to drop that gun because otherwise, you know, he can sniff it out and he'll kill you. So at the end, when Ray's holding a gun in front of Harry, in front of what's left of the mural, you know, it, the story makes us think that, oh, okay, Lucia went back to the other dimension. I guess the mural is dead now. It doesn't work anymore. But no, because, you know, obviously there's still some energy there. And the creature jumps out of the mural and it kills Ray, and and then you know, he Harry runs over and, and uh, yells out Lucia's name, but it seems like he can't do anything because the room is empty, the images are static. Mm -hmm. But then he goes like, "Oh no, oh Lucia!" And then he sees a little shooting star shoot across the mural, and and he sees Lucia coming out of the wall to to take uh -oh. him, and it's like. It's a happy ending, you know. Yeah. So a little hokey, but you know, it, it kind of feels rewarding. And they go together into the metacosm, which me, you know, when they're calling this Harry Demore's first adventure, it seems like okay, his second adventure was going to be even more uh, ambitious than this one. If they're going to be hanging out in in another world the whole time. Yeah, wouldn't that be something though? Yeah. I mean, they could have turned him into this interdimensional like super detective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I would hate to see it become, you know, because Harry doesn't really have relationships that last. So I would hate to see it be like uh, the Karate Kid or whatever, where, you know, in the second movie, he's like, he's like, oh, yeah, she um, she ran off with the football captain or whatever. Right. They usually do that when they have to recast uh, the one of the, the, the lovers. Right. Yeah. I mean, unless it's Back to the Future where they replaced a. Uh, that original uh, uh, Marty's Actress. girlfriend with Elizabeth Shue in the second movie. Yeah, yeah. They did that. But um, very entertaining. Like I said, as a movie, I'm not sure if this would have been – it would have aged a little quickly, I think, because of the way that it's made. And But there's so much crazy stuff in here that I think that it, it would have – 
it, it would have had lasting power. I mean, just because, you know, like Ghostbusters or... or yeah, but for example, the priest pressing the O in Holy Bible and getting a couple of blades jump out and killing yeah. two guards, that seems like it wouldn't have aged very well. People would be <laughs> laughing at that nowadays. They'd be like, yeah. oh, wow, look at that. Um, but yeah, definitely you can see the the genius of Clyde Barker and the his ideas for The Great and Secret Show and the art books and all that mm-hmm. in here. I'm just glad that Clive, for, you know, for most of The Great and Secret Show came up with less complicated sounding names for some things. Yeah. 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 And, and they're, well, in, in books, they're introduced more slowly. Um, the, in, in this, in this movie, you're like just thrown in the things. middle of it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is not bad. I mean, I think that in a movie, it's not quite, it's not quite so hard to follow as when you're reading a script. Right. Well, I think Clive was writing also to the audience that he thought was going to be seeing this movie uh, in America in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. So uh, did you there's, notice the reference to Godzilla in this script? Uh, yeah, there was, I think, one on, on Norma's TV, right? There was a Godzilla yeah. movie. Yeah. That would yeah, be cool. Yeah. That is nice. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah, the Three Stooges. I mean, the Three Stooges were were popular again back in the late 80s early 90s i guess there were a lot of reruns of that um i remember that's when i kind of got in touch with the three stooges was probably in the early 90s um as there was kind of a revival around that time you remember when there were all sorts of like shows that had clips being played like uh, dream on uh, it was a tv show i don't know if you ever saw that dream on no nope. okay all right um, so yeah, there was another thing in this, uh, article that was written about this script, uh, where he kind of goes into why this movie may not have been done or produced. Mm-hmm. He says that, um, okay. So comparisons to another HP Lovecraft, the detective in home box office's newest film cast a deadly spell are also evident in spell a down on his luck PI named Lovecraft becomes involved in a supernatural fight to save the world from invading parallel universe Cthulhu demons along the way, tangling with several monsters. Sound familiar? And he says, perhaps Spell is the reason A&M Films decided to pass on the great unknown. And then he goes on to... ever happen? I don't remember that. Oh, uh, Cast a Deadly Spell? Yes, it happened. Oh, okay. Uh, I've seen it. Yeah, it's a good movie. But it's more like a comedy. It's it's like L.A., everybody knows magic and casts spells on everyday life and stuff like that just to make life easier. And it's kind of weird. And, you know, obviously the references are really too much on the nose. Like the detective's name is Lovecraft, for God's yeah. sake. But so, of course, then he goes on to trash the trailer a little more. Um, so and then he says that Barker is currently working on the script for The Last Illusion. His cabal short story, which introduced Harry Demore. A&M hopes to start production on the film next year with Barker directing. I think this is the, the beginning of the Lord of Illusions movie. Yeah. Yeah, that, that thing got rewritten so many times. Yeah, I guess. I guess. It was like five scripts. Yeah. And, I mean, come on. And then at the end he says, if I want magic plague detectives, I'll stick to Hellblazer. Perhaps Clive should too. I, I, I'm not oh, even mentioning horrible. some of the... I know. I'm not even mentioning some of the worst parts of this article where he actually trashes this because I think it's complete nonsense. Yeah, but, and uh, Harry Demore is from like 1984. You can't. I think that this script would make a great comic book adaptation. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Christian Francis, uh, Francis and Mark Miller and Ben Mears just throwing this out there. Yeah. Yep. The Great Unknown. Harry Demore's first adventure. It would be better than turning Harry Demore into Pinhead, for sure. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like they did with the Boom comics. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I think this would have been awesome. I would have just changed a few things, like the Nizaku. I would have made him a more uh, a less funny character, a less... I, I would make him more into... more helpful to the story mm. at the end. Uh, and not so detached from everything, because it feels like he just doesn't care about anything that's going on. No, he the Nizako. And at the end, I guess I would just take out the, the the saccharine ending at the end, where he's like, he goes back to the crossover house and he finds Lucia and he 
he he walks through the mural and it's like, oh, they're embracing, they're kissing. Now they're going to another dimension together. I would have taken out that part, to be honest. I would have just left Harry in his apartment waiting for the next case and just, you know, cracking open like a, a shot of whiskey and just that would be like the perfect ending for me. Yeah, I think in a comic book it would have it would have a little more time to to sort of get used to some of these ideas and some of these creatures and characters and and uh, worlds that they come from. And it could even um, inspire some other spinoffs or some other you know uh, fleshing out some backstory here. You, yeah. you can make this last a lot longer than the time it takes to read the script because the script is basically just it starts in one day and kind of ends almost in the other um right right yeah there's really there's really only like maybe two days right in the whole yeah it it could also become kind of a novel of sorts i mean geez if you just pat it out a little more yeah if you start if you start like if you open up um the story with the prison breaks and the, you know, the the mental hospital riots and all this. But then you kind of cut, um, you, you give us a little more backstory on what the metacosm is and, you know, show like some previous battle between these two factions, between the Tetrarch and the other uh, faction. Yeah. Um, I mean, gosh, this could be fleshed out into a book. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or a yeah. TV miniseries. Or a TV miniseries. I mean, nowadays this would have been amazing. I know we kind of just spoiled the story, but the story has been spoiled back in like the early '90s, anyway. And the script is out there, so it's being sold. Um, so it's yeah. not like this is secret anymore. This is out. So yeah. that's another reason why we chose that. We, we, we kind of talked to Seraphin and said, "Hey, this script is out. It's being bought and sold on eBay. This was already spoiled in like the '90s. Can we do this?" And they said, "Yeah, it should be fine. No problem." Yeah. So that's why we kind of spoil the story. But I hope you guys can find a copy of this. And if you do, let us know what you think. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Great Unknown, Harry DeMore's First Adventure. Uh, so before we go, I did want to get a little bit into um, what's going on with us. Uh, if you go over to CliveBarkerCast.com, uh, Jose, you tracked down the, the Shutter Q&A with Clive Barker and posted all of the questions and answers, which I think there were three, right? Yes, I think it was just three questions and three answers. Yeah. Uh, other Another kind of neat surprise is that uh, Rob uh, Reidenauer uh, came came back and po- made a post on the website. He did a, a Tuesday Tunes with uh, Dancing in the Dark from the Lord of Illusions soundtrack by Diamanda Galas. Mm-hmm. Very good choice. Yeah. I'm really happy to see Rob come back to make another article. Yeah, and, and coming up, um, our next episode is going to be, we're going to be coming back to Clive Barker's A to Z of Horror, uh, the end of round one of the Duels of Blood and the beginning of round two. And after that, at some point, we're also going to have a, um, a, a audio commentary for Hellraiser Bloodline. That should be a hoot. That yeah. should be a hoot. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we can get Rob to join us for that one. Yeah, yeah. We've been we've been working on that. So that's that's our next like several episodes coming up. And um for the Kickstarter, where are we at? We the um we're still waiting to hear back on the app designs. That's kind of out of our hands right now. Um I went out and bought some some shipping stuff. I've got envelopes and poster tubes ready to go. Uh, for some of the posters and stuff, and once we get those shipped out, we can focus a little more on the the book. Yeah, yeah, and and translated, transcribing more episodes. Uh, I also have some of the Smiling World posters and and other posters that we were selling on the Kickstarter, and I also have some some shipping to do this weekend. So as yeah. soon as we do that, we'll give you guys an update. Yeah, yeah, and and and. Um, Give you uh, tracking. We'll send you tracking when 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 those go out. Yeah, on priority or something. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, all right. Another uh, another interesting uh, script. I'm sorry if we jumped around the script a little bit. Uh, we'll link you guys to that uh, picture of that article that we keep mentioning. Yeah. And uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe in the future this script will become a little more available than it is now, but. 
obviously for you know for for uh, copyright purposes we can't really provide any copy to this so you're just gonna have to listen to our episode and yeah. try to piece it together okay and this podcast having no beginning will have no end you can find the show notes for this page and lots of Clive Barker news and features at www.clivebarkercast.com. Leave comments there or get them directly into the podcast by clicking the Send Voicemail tab on the right. Please follow us on Twitter at BarkerCast or at Occupy Midian. Like us on Facebook and join the Occupy Midian Facebook group. You can listen on the site or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Libsyn, TuneIn, Pocket Cast, Google Play, and Double Twist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Please take a couple of minutes to leave us a review on iTunes. It means the world to us and helps us spread the word about Clive Barker. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial fan site and podcast that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Films. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.